You have to tell me what you can. Uh, As of right now, I can see your slide and it looks like it's in full screen or full presentation mode. Okay, now the challenge is whether it will advance and you can see it. Can you yes. See it? Yes. Oh, Perfect. Okay. <laughs> so in good shape. so I, I stopped doing the video because that tends to interfere with uh, the bandwidth so that hopefully that'll uh, resolve itself. So welcome everybody. And uh, I want to uh, encourage you or, or prompt you to know that there will be a special free bonus opportunity at the end. Okay. Um, now, let's see if any of you can identify with this scenario. You're managing a project and it comes in late over budget and disappointing. Now, I'm sure that uh, that's never happened to any of you, but it sure has happened to me and everybody I've ever met who's managed a project. And what also happens is you get blamed and you get accused of failing to manage the project adequately. Okay? And then what do they do? They bounce you off of it and put somebody else on and that poor schnook gets the same results six months later or whatever. So, oh, what's happened to my animation here? Um, so, all of a sudden, I'm uh, not progressing. Um, okay. So, uh, let me share with you what I see as the objectives for today. And let, let me just point out that I think it should be evident that if every project manager is failing to manage, maybe that's not the real problem. So I wanna look at what may actually be happening that's causing projects to be wrong late and over budget and give you some ideas where you might intervene to give yourself a chance for success. And I wanna introduce you to a powerful tool called the problem pyramid to help you define achievable projects. So I'm gonna suggest that because we tend to follow flawed models, that that destines our projects for failure. And there are flawed project management and system development models, flawed business analysis models, flawed requirements models. And we'll look at each of those uh, as we go forward here. So many of you are familiar with the, the SDLC, the system or software development lifecycle, uh, analysis, design, development, implementation, and then go into operations and maintenance. And many of you are also aware that there is a corresponding project management life cycle, the main part of which is directing and controlling the execution of the project. Okay. That's the biggest part of, of project um, management. And then at the end, there's typically post-implementation review and uh, attempts at process improvement. And so we end up defining a project identifying what it's supposed to produce, getting a schedule and budget for it, and then developing tasks to carry it out. And I'm sure that that sounds pretty familiar to, to most of you. And then what's also familiar is you get in trouble. And you can't deliver the product within the budget and schedule. And in fact, what you do deliver often turns out to be disappointing, uh, riddled with quality issues, all of which add to the time and effort that it takes to get this uh, back on track. Now, this is where most project managers fail and most projects fail and the project manager, as we said, tends to get blamed for not managing properly. And I want to suggest to you that it's not your 
not managing properly, although there could be some of that, but that you're confronted with basically an impossible project, that the budget and schedule that are provided for you is simply inadequate to develop whatever product you're supposed to produce. And no matter how well you manage, no matter how many uh, uh, certifications you have or Gantt charts or whatever, it ain't gonna come in on time and in budget because it was destined for failure. Now, what this slide at this point is not showing is where does that project definition come from? It is the output of feasibility analysis. That in from the development standpoint, the feasibility analysis is where the project gets defined. And in the project management life cycle, that's the initiating activities, the planning and organizing activities. And these are what produce your definition of the project, what is to produce your budget and your schedule. And there are a lot of people that uh, don't have feasibility analysis. Okay. They actually have it, they're just not aware of it or planning and organizing. They have it, but they're not aware of it. It's happening in essentially zero seconds. In other words, many projects get defined and destined for failure before most of us and our colleagues actually get involved. So by the time we get a project identified for us, it's already too late. Perhaps you can identify with that. Now, what's at the heart of this is that the basis for defining your project are top level real business requirements. That's, the, that's what should be discovered and developed and analyzed during the upfront feasibility or planning and organizing activities, because that's what becomes the basis for identifying the project, what's to be produced, and then a relevant budget and schedule for it. In the typical treatment of projects, requirements tend to be considered only with regard to the analysis or requirements phase. And that's the point at which requirements detail is elaborated. But recognize if the top level requirements have not been defined adequately, then whatever gets detailed is highly unlikely to be right. And we're busy detailing stuff that turns out not to be right, which is why our projects fail. And then of course, when they're not right, that increases the budget and schedule, or not the budget, but the effort and time needed to fix it. Okay. And that's what's really happening in many, if not most of our projects. And perhaps you can look back and see that happening, uh, although maybe nobody was identifying that in your own world. So when the top level real business requirements are not defined adequately, you're gonna end up with projects that are impossible. And all the effort later isn't gonna make up for the fact that you're on the wrong track to start out with. So what's the impact on the project? Failure. What's the impact on the project manager? Failure. And this is what I think you will find is actually happening if you go back and re-examine the projects that you've had experience with that encountered difficulties. And I bet that you're gonna find that it's the budget and schedule, you, you went over budget, you went over schedule because they were not right. 
Now, in the, in the development process, there are really two major places where requirements definition should occur. One of them is up front where we're identifying top level requirements. This is also where you set your strategy. And that's often occurring implicitly. And that's a problem because it needs to be explicit. When it's implicit, it's too easy for it to get messed up. And then the place that people tend to think of as where requirements analysis occurs in the analysis or requirements phase. And that's often done iteratively. There's nothing that says how big a piece you're going to analyze at any given time. So if you're in agile or anything else, you still have to discover and analyze requirements. The only thing that's at issue is how big a piece you're dealing with. Now, business analysis okay, has an essential responsibility of defining requirements. Okay. But people with business analysis roles and titles and training often don't get involved until the requirement space. Okay. In other words, by the time they get involved, the project is already destined for failure. And now, some of you may be familiar with conducting feasibility analyses. So sometimes a feasibility analysis is conducted by a project manager or similar uh, type of role. Okay. Um, sometimes considered pre-project. In other words, it's very common to say, well, all of this analysis is to determine whether or not we should have a project and what that project should, should be about. But recognize, and nothing against those of you who are project managers, and I've managed many projects, okay? business analysis is not the typical skill or focus of a project manager. And very often, the project manager is out there by himself or herself, for instance, doing a feasibility analysis, which is largely a business analysis activity, but the project manager may not have relevant business analysis skills. Now, the other side of it is that sometimes feasibility analyses are done typically as separate projects. And sometimes business analysts are in fact assigned to do the feasibility analysis and there's no project manager involved. So guess what? The business analyst also has to act as project manager, but business analysts tend not to have project management skills and awareness. So whenever somebody is doing a job that isn't really their uh, skill set area, there's a pretty good chance that they're going to encounter difficulties. And those things tend to happen, especially with regard to getting projects initiated in the start from the start in the right place and in the right direction. To add to this, feasibility analysis typically includes determining return on investment. And I'm sorry to say that neither project managers nor business analysts tend to be real skilled and knowledgeable about this. And to take it even further, and, and you can, uh, judge for yourself, but as I read PMBOK, it kind of says re return on investment, financial analysis is the responsibility of somebody else, either financial people or business analysts. And in the BABOK, the business analysis body and knowledge, it says, oh, 
financial analysis is important, project manager will do it or something to that effect. In other words, the bodies of knowledge are handing this off. Now, the other thing that tends to happen, and this happens a lot, is that projects get initiated by executives. Often as part of some kind of a uh, project initiation or uh, uh, top level uh, strategic planning activity or whatever, it may be all kinds of rigmarole, but the net effect of it is often that projects get defined by executives who think that their level in the organization qualifies them to know all this stuff, when in fact, knowing the necessary information comes from suitable feasibility analysis, which as we said, is a form of business analysis or largely a form of business analysis. And the executives who are doing this, who are taking it upon themselves to declare that they know what the answers are, often don't have adequate requirements definition skills. They may not have adequate business analysis and project management skills as well, but it doesn't stop them. And so they end up creating projects which they think are brilliant, and then those projects fail because the, in their minds, the project manager didn't know how to manage. And in fact, it's because they created projects which were destined to fail. Now, many of you are undoubtedly involved with agile development. Notice that agile does not specifically recognize business analyst roles. The people with business analysis skills and possibly titles may or may not be involved. There, uh, in the early days of Agile, extreme programming was the, the dominant technique. And extreme programming teams, project teams, consisted of two or more developers and a customer representative who was responsible for defining the requirements. There's no project manager, there's no business analyst, there's nothing there except programmers and a customer rep. And there's no saying how much that customer representative knew or didn't know about defining requirements. In Scrum, which is clearly the dominant agile technique these days, the Scrum team consists of a Scrum master, a product owner, and the rest of the team. And the product owner is generally responsible for providing requirements. And once again, there's no business analyst role per se, but the product owner is responsible for doing business analysis, whether or not the product owner has any skills or knowledge or experience in that. And then once the product owner has declared, here is a user story, which is an agile uh, form for requirements, then the developers take over and elaborate those user story requirements in conversations. And that elaboration can take many forms and have a very wide degree of effectiveness. Now, Babak was modeled after Pimbok, and Babak consists of a number of uh, knowledge areas, which Babak says are not life cycle phases. But golly gee, Williker, the way that they're described in Babak sure sounds like life cycle phases. 
So Babbock tends to consider enterprise or renamed strategy analysis as pre-project, wherein senior management defines business needs and defines the product system software to meet the need and the objectives thereof. And that initiates the project. So when senior management is initiating the project, a business analyst, according to Babock, even though Babock uh, doesn't say this explicitly, it, it's really what they're saying is that Senior managers are, are full of magic and they wondrously understand everything right, great at strategy, always make wise decisions, all that other stuff that you and I know doesn't always happen. Uh, and I hope none of you are uh, part of Silicon Valley Bank. Um, but I mean, a perfect example of where the people at the top were the problem. Now, in 2008, the people at the top were the problem, but the people at the bottom were the ones who took the hit. This time, hopefully, it might be a little bit different. But in all their magical brilliance, senior management makes some declarations, and what passes for a licitation by the business analyst is actually simply taking dictation, writing down what the senior management is declaring, not really doing any discovery or analysis. And then once that project gets initiated, then according to Babbock, there are two processes or knowledge areas, elicitation and requirements analysis, which once again, Babbock says are not life cycle phases, but are described like life cycle phases. First you do elicitation, then you do requirements analysis. And as Babbock describes this, elicitation involves the business analyst gathering descriptions from stakeholders of the product system software that they think they need. And then the an analysis of that is the, the business analyst digs into that and analyzes that product system or software in terms of its features and usage requirements. Okay. Now, I think you will find that Pimbach tends to say less about this, but is fairly much in line with what Babbock describes. And so as Babbock describes it, even though the Babbock authors vehemently deny this, what they're calling elicitation is often largely passive dictation. And especially about the business objectives that they're primarily taking you know, verbatim, whatever the senior exec executives choose to say. And then they're taking verbatim from the, the users, the people downstream who are more directly involved with the project or, pro or product or system or software. You know, tell us what the features should be. Describe them to us. Lay out screens for us to build because that's what we like to do. Now, in case you're interested, uh, I've got an article called Should Babbock Include Shorthand? Uh, this is uh, an article that it was a feature article on uh, what was called the Requirements Networking Group, which was prominent uh, a few years ago and then went out of business. And so uh, I was working with a, uh, a, a some people developing a uh, requirements management tool, and they had uh, resources on their website. So we transferred this article to their website, and then they went out of business. So I've stopped relying on third parties to keep this available for the public. 
If you would like a copy of it, send me an email at robin at gopromanagement.com and I'll send you a copy of it. Recognize that in Babak, analysis is analysis of the product system or software that you expect to create. And recognize that in spite of or because of following Babak and or Pimbak, projects still encounter creep. And the analysts blame it on the users. Project managers blame it on the users. And the management blames it on the project managers. So perhaps some of you can identify with this or look back to your prior experience. So let me share with you what Pimbach and uh, the project management uh, uh, business analysis materials say with regard to this. And I'm re referencing Pimbach 6 because the seven, up through the sixth edition, Pimbach dealt with things like requirements, parts of the project that the project manager was managing. I'm sure you're aware that the seventh edition dramatically changes the content and emphases of Pimbach so that now they're paying attention to stakeholder engagement where requirements are kind of an afterthought and barely addressed. But in uh, six and earlier, I think that there was greater attention to needs assessment than in Babak and creation of business cases, but it was considered pre-project and largely limited to a high level view. And um, the definition of requirement condition or capability that is required to be present in a product, service, or result to satisfy an agreement or other, other formally imposed specification. And, uh, you know, I think, I think you can see that that's really aimed at what are you going to create, what are you going to build, not what's it for, why are we doing this? Now, to be fair, I think that PMI's approach to business analysis uh, is less starstruck with magical thinking. Uh, Babak treats strategy very much from a, a hands-off. Uh, it's, it's the province of senior executives, and they're all wizards. Okay. Um, that I think I think. Uh, PMI is better at recognizing that there is an analysis involved up front and that uh, there is more attention to analysis in developing business cases and feasibility analyses, but still overlooking that most projects originate far lower than the or in the organization than at the senior executive levels. And most projects originate without explicit, formal, or informed initiation. So all of the project initiation rigmarole that, that organizations go through, I think you'll find deals with only a fraction of the projects that you actually get involved with. And regardless whether it's done formally or informally, it's often done poorly. Starts with mistaken presumptions about what the problems are and what the solutions are. And the projects then get initiated on the wrong track and consequently are destined to fail. And a lot of that is because analysis that needs to be done, nobody recognizes that need or recognizes that it needs to be done well. 
And the executives, once again, think that their position warrants their making these declarations. Now, before you break your arm, patting yourself on the back, I'm going to say, unfortunately, in my experience, very few trained business analysts or trained project managers actually know how to do upfront work well. Okay. Uh, some of that is attributable to the deficiencies in Babak and Pimbach. Some of that's attributable to, to generally mistaken models that people follow. So let me suggest the different, and I hope you'll find it a better approach, that discovering the real, what I call real business requirements, and we'll elaborate on that in a second, is the starting point of any project that is going to be effective. Okay. Whether or not you have formal mechanisms for doing that. A project needs to start with getting the real business requirements. And part of being real is that they turn out to be right. Now, that may or may not involve senior executives, but just because they're there doesn't mean that they know. And it could be considered pre-project or the beginning of a project. Doesn't matter. You still need to get the real business requirements right. And you need to recognize that it's not an issue of whether the business or the users or the stakeholders don't know what they want. It's whether the development and project process knows what is needed. And if the development or project process doesn't know what is actually needed, then they're going to end up building the wrong things or not building the right things. Okay. Now, you can point fingers at the business for not dictating to you what uh, you wish they had known to do, but it's the project and development processes that are failing there, in part because they're often over-relying on business people to dictate. Now, many of you are familiar with the term creep and uh, uh, the central concept of creep is that requirements change and uh, a lot of people are convinced that requirements change constantly. I'm gonna suggest to you that the real business requirements can change but tend not to change very much. But what does change is the awareness of them. And when you become aware of what you could have and should have known but didn't know, declare that it's because the users told you the wrong stuff and they didn't know. Okay. And that's, you're blaming somebody for shortcomings in your process and, and your models. So, the role of the business, the user, the stakeholder is not to design product systems and software. And the role of business analysis, whether it's done by a business analyst or a project manager or an executive or a product owner or somebody else, regardless, that role is to understand the business and its needs and identify relevant, reasonable ways to satisfy those needs. So effective analysis intertwines the elicitation of data, not elicitation of requirements, with analysis. So you gather some data, you analyze it, you gather some more data, analyze it, analyze some more and you're analyzing it to first understand the real problem or opportunity or challenge and the real business value to be obtained from solving that business problem or taking that opportunity or meeting that challenge. In order to do that, you gotta understand what's causing those problems 
and then identify reasonable real business requirements that when satisfied, provide value by solving the problem. So we've got discovery, and that's an interactive process, combining eliciting and analyzing data. And then there's further analysis of analyzing and data, which can lead to eliciting additional data. Okay, and this is not a one shot. This is not a step one, step two. This is an ongoing interactive and iterative process. And out of that, we start by identifying top level real business requirements. And we use various review techniques to give us greater confidence that they're right. And then we selectively drive them down to greater detail and also apply review techniques to make sure that those are right. And this is, an, once again, an iterative and incremental process. Now, this brings us to two types of requirements. Now, this is different from what Babak and Pimbach say. And it's different because, in my humble opinion, it's what really works and makes sense. So on the left, we have what I call real business requirements. Now, real business requirements are also called user requirements, stakeholder requirements, customer requirements. I use those terms interchangeably. Real business requirements are from the perspective of and in the language of the business, the user, the stakeholder, the customer. They are conceptual and they exist within the business environment. Because they exist, they need to be discovered. Real business requirements are what's. What's that provide value when they are satisfied or met or delivered. And they provide value by serving business objectives, solving needs, solving problems, taking opportunities, meeting challenges. Now, I think there's a pretty good chance that that's similar to what you mean by requirements. Recognize that there are usually many possible ways to accomplish the real business requirements on the left. Product, system, software requirements, and I use those terms interchangeably, although I recognize that some of you make big distinctions, especially between system and software requirements. Now, the difference is that system requirements include hardware and software, whereas software requirements are just software. For my purposes here, those distinctions are not relevant. I use the term product system software requirements interchangeably. The critical thing to realize is that these are from the view and in the language of a human defined product system or software, which is presumably one of these many possible ways presumably how to presumably accomplish the presumed business requirements. Now, perhaps you noticed that I emphasize the word presumed. That's because product requirements on the right are often the result of presumptions. And presumptions have a way of being wrong. And the more that we presume, the more wrong we are likely to be. Notice, by the way, that product requirements are often also referred to as functional requirements or specifications, and then going along with that are non-functional requirements or specifications. Regardless, they are all forms of high-level design. They're design of a presumed product system or software. Products do not by themselves provide value. A product provides value if and only if, and only to the extent that it satisfies real business requirements. Real business requirements are what provide value when they are satisfied. Now, 
creep changes to requirements when they are established, okay, I think you will find a lot of people, including a lot of textbooks and a lot of supposed authorities, say that creep is caused by requirements, meaning product requirements on the right, that are not sufficiently clear. I'm sure some of you have heard this. In the testing community, where I also do a lot of work, the general consensus is that the big issue with requirements is whether or not they are testable. And a requirement is not testable if you cannot create tests to demonstrate that the requirement has been satisfied. The primary reason why a requirement is not testable is because it's not clear. And so the conventional wisdom is that requirements, meaning product requirements, creep because they are not sufficiently clear or testable. And I'm sure many of you have heard that and possibly said something like that in your past. I'm going to suggest to you that while clarity and testability is important, much of creep occurs because the product requirements, regardless of how clear and testable they are, turn out not to satisfy the real business requirements. And the primary reason why the product requirements don't satisfy the real business requirements is because the real business requirements have not been defined adequately. And the primary reason why the real business requirements are not defined adequately is because the conventional wisdom says that the requirements, quote unquote, are the product requirements on the right. So creep occurs because the product doesn't satisfy the real business requirements because they haven't been defined adequately, because the models are wrong. So uh, to be fair, my computer's taking a little time here to change slides, bear with me. So Babak, uh, lesser extent Pimbach, uh, uses terms like business requirements, and they adopt what I call the levels model of requirements. And according to the levels model of requirements, business requirements are high level and vague and decompose into product requirements, which are detailed. So according to the levels model, the difference between business requirements and product requirements is just a level of detail or a level of abstraction. And business requirements are goals and needs and objectives, purposes to be solved, the expected benefits. Okay. So if you, according to the levels model, and I'm sure that many of you are familiar with this and many of you have probably adopted it and accepted it, According to the levels model, if you have a requirement that's detailed, that's a product requirement. If you have a requirement that's high level and vague, that's a business requirement. Now, hopefully you can begin to realize why that model is 100% wrong. Business requirements are what? Product requirements are how? What does not decompose into how? Rather, how is a response to the what. And all the detail in the world on the how without knowing the what cannot help but create creep. And so the models are actually causing much of our difficulty. So if you're gonna avoid creep, you need to realize that business requirements are not just high level, but they need to be driven down to detail. And no matter how far down in detail you drive them, they are always business deliverable what's that when delivered contribute to providing value. Driving them down to lower levels of detail 
never turns them into products. But driving them down to lower levels of detail makes it easier to design products that map to and satisfy those real business requirements. And that's how we build the right stuff and avoid the creep. Now, to help us with this, I've developed what I call the problem pyramid. And the problem pyramid is a disciplined six-step process. You need to, it's got six steps or boxes, which need to be carried out in the numbered sequence. First box, the problem, opportunity, or challenge, that's what's going to provide value when it's addressed adequately. Now, in my experience, most projects that even define a problem, including with problem statements, simply accept the problem as stated. I'm sure if you look back, you can realize that defining the problem correctly is, is hard and that often it's not defined correctly. The problem pyramid includes disciplined systematic processes for giving us greater confidence that the problem, opportunity, or challenge has been defined correctly. Part of that is identifying relevant measures. Box two measures that tell us it's a problem. Box three measures that indicate the problem has been solved. Satisfying box three is the basis for benefit and value. Benefit and value come about by addressing the problem, okay? solving the problem. Okay? Not what you build, but what it does with regard to your problem, opportunity, or challenge. We don't solve problems directly. We solve them by identifying their cause or causes. Those of you who are familiar with uh, process terminology recognize that the causes are what's known as the as-is or current state process. And they are producing the current measures that tell us we've got a problem. <clears throat> Excuse me. We solve the problem by identifying the box five should be's. These are the real business requirements. The business deliverable what's that when delivered will reasonably achieve the box three goal measures and thereby provide the benefit and value. Okay. And box six, the specific way that the box five should be what's can be delivered. That's design. Now, I think you will find that many of your projects get in trouble because they start at box six and don't know boxes one through five. So let me give you an example. This was an example that was provided by a student in one of my requirements classes. And uh, she was in charge of what's called the reuse repository for a global financial services organization. And her problem pyramid was that uh, reuse data were not globally accessible, were a certain number of people that don't have access. Her goal measure was that all people have access. She said the causes were that some people were using standalone PCs and that while there was an internet, it wasn't well developed and developing it wasn't a priority, and or should be was give everyone access via the web and internet. And I think you can agree that that leads to a pretty obvious project. It turns out that problem pyramids are a lot harder to do than they look. They look easy, but they're hard to do. 
And so we have some guidelines for helping us get the problem right. Now, is it really a problem? If you just ask the person who said, here's my problem, if you say, is that really the problem? They're gonna say, of course it is. Now that's what passes for executive scrutiny in many organizations. It's useless. Instead, we ask things like, do the measures fit? Does it provide real value when the goal's achieved? Are the causes actually causing it? Do they reasonably explain why we have the problem? Have we identified all the likely key causes? And does the should be solve the problem? Is it business deliverable what's that are likely to meet the goal when, when satisfied? Does it address and reduce and or eliminate each key cause? Because if you don't, you're still gonna have your problem. And what else needs to be addressed? that this affects or is affected by this. It becomes more difficult because problems can be hierarchical. And so the challenge is identifying the appropriate level of problem. And so it's this is Goldilocks. We're relying on judgment, knowledge, your experience to get to the right level. If your problem is world hunger, well, that's too big to solve. If your problem is that you want a potato chip with lunch, maybe that's too small. You're looking for the lowest level problem that produces real value when the goal measure is achieved. This gets further complicated because causes can have current and goal measures. The difference is that if you achieve a causes goal measure, that by itself does not produce real value. <clears throat> you only get real value from achieving a problem's goal measures. Sometimes it's very difficult to make relevant distinctions. And so it can be helpful to take things to extremes. What if we didn't do it? What if we did a whole lot of it? So when we look at the reuse repository problem pyramid, and reuse data are not globally accessible, sounds like a problem in the number of people that don't have access, sounds like a measure of global accessibility. But if all people have access, does that necessarily provide any real value? No. Where's the value come from? From actually reusing things. And so reuse data are not globally accessible isn't about that value. It's a cause of why people are not reusing things. And there can be other key causes. Okay. Like there's, uh, people don't know where to find these things to reuse them. They don't know how to reuse them. Maybe there is nothing to reuse. Maybe they just don't want to. And give everyone access via the web and internet is a how, not a what, and is simply a restatement of the all people have access goal. Now, I think you can see that if we had followed our typical bent and done that obvious project, it would have resulted in failure. So instead, not reusing to advantage measures of reuse, low percentage currently versus a higher percentage is gonna enable us to spend less time and money. The causes are elaborated to what we said, and now this should be. People understand how to do reuse and why it helps them get their jobs done quicker, easier, better. Okay, I, think, I think you'll find that that's business, deliverable what, that when delivered, contributes to achieving the box three goal measure and thereby providing value. Same thing for people have meaningful support and encouragement to take the time to make relevant items reusable and people can easily access, identify and retrieve relevant reuse items. So I think if you ended up creating a designing product system or software, to satisfy these box five real business requirements, you're much more likely to have a project that will succeed. Okay. Now, this is an iterative process. 
We start by identifying top level real business requirements. Data elicitation and analysis is involved. We review and refine them iteratively until we reach agreement that we have accurately defined the requirement scope, box five of the problem pyramid. Then only then does it make sense to make estimates of what it'll take to satisfy that. Okay. Estimating time, cost, risk. Okay. And often then that results in prioritization and trade-off analysis which ends up identifying one or more implementation projects. Notice that the scope of any project is its top level real business requirements. And going along with that, we often have what's called a high level conceptual design to give kind of a bridge between requirements and design. Okay. And then we selectively drive down one or more of those top level requirements that we're actually implementing to do additional data elicitation and analysis to develop a set of more detailed real business requirements. And then based on that to design a product system software and its requirements and specifications and very often use cases to describe its usage. So going through an awful lot Quickly, hopefully you've seen what I consider the real reason many projects are late, wrong, and over budget, because their budgets and definitions of the product and schedule are wrong and impossible. And if you're going to have a chance for success, you've got to intervene before you are stuck with a project that is destined to fail. And I think you will find that using the problem pyramid can dramatically increase your ability to do this. So this is a diagram of some of the courses and consulting that I do, defining and managing requirements, writing user stories, managing projects. This is some information about me. I've got some online seminars coming up at the Software Excellence Academy, uh, addressing non-functional or illities requirements and agile user stories on Thursday. Thursday, May 4th all day, and uh, defining and writing real business or user requirements, Monday and Tuesday, May 22nd and 23rd all day. If you attend live, you get a discount and you get to interact in, you know, in real time. If not, you can spend more to watch at your time and convenience on demand. If you become an all access member, of the Software Excellence Academy. You can attend these and any other uh, seminars and webinars for free. So I mentioned a special free bonus opportunity. I have been starting to start the writing of my successor book, Write, Ad Write, Write Agile User Stories and Acceptance Tests. And I'm finally actually doing it and declaring it publicly. And I'm giving you an opportunity to participate in that as an advanced reviewer, helping review what I've said and contributing to my forthcoming book. Okay. If you would like to do that, send me an email at robin at gopromanagement.com with the subject, write, write. Okay. And please tell me a little bit about yourself, including your agile or user story experience. That's not going to weigh on whether or not I accept you. If you apply, I accept you, but it can help me understand where you're coming from. And then after you've sent me your information, I'll follow up with more information and access to the draft to review. So thank you very much. Uh, John, I think we've uh, had a successful project here. We're more or less done on time, um, but I'm perfectly uh, eager to stick around and answer questions if anybody has any. Thank you much, everybody. Thank you very much, Robin. I appreciate uh, the great presentation you give, and especially the ideas of this bonus opportunity to be part of their, your upcoming book. And with that, we're a little past one o'clock.
Thank you again for everybody for joining. Thank you again for Robin for your present presentation. And we will see you next month. Okay, and if Thank anybody you. has any questions or comments, because we didn't get a chance to get to them, please email me and I will do my best to respond. <laughs>